I uh, invite you to turn with me to Colossians 3, and we'll be studying verses 1 through 17 today. And uh, as, as you do that, maybe pause the video and go find the message outline that is available via the link below or through the weekly email that gets sent out. Now, as we begin, I, I would like to begin with a, a short story. Let's see. A wealthy businessman who is well known for uh, being ruthless and unethical told Mark Twain that before he died, he wanted to make a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. He said that when he got there, he wanted to climb uh, to the top of Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments and there re read the Ten Commandments aloud at the top. And Mark Twain responded in his typical wit and said, I have a better idea. You could stay in Boston and keep them. See, Paul was writing to the Colossians because a few false teachings had come up. And he was writing to correct those. See, they had ideas about how you should live and what rules you had to keep and how you should eat and things kind of of that nature. They thought to be, that to be a better Christian, you had to do certain things to achieve spiritual perfection. Kind of like that guy reading the Ten Commandments at the top of Mount Sinai. Now, uh, uh, they were located about 100 miles away inland from uh, Ephesus and would have been highly influenced by Asian cultures from, uh, you know, from Asia Minor because they were in Asia Minor there. Um, and, and Paul was writing to this church to correct the heresies that had come up due to this mixture of, uh, of cultural influence. Now, the, uh, the Colossian church had fallen into this form of kind of Jewish legalism along with some Eastern philosophy mixed in. And basically, they thought they needed to keep the Old Testament law, but they also valued knowledge. Their understanding of uh, spirituality was that the outside or the external needed fixing before the inside could be. Or the body and actions needed to be fixed before the heart and mind could. In other words, the opposite of what we believe. So, But what, what does that look like? Now, <clears throat> Paul, I, I think he's going to answer this question in today's passage. See, Paul calls us to live alive in Christ. And what does he mean by that? In the, uh, in the first portion of the passage, he talks about moving from sin to life in Christ. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the first 11 verses of today's passage, really, is to move from sin to life in Christ. In uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3, Paul says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, Paul calls us to set our hearts and minds on things above, or in other words, to seek the heavenly. And, and th these first three points, this first part of the outline is actually straight from Dr. Wearsby. I really liked how he captured these first three segments in short, simple sentences. So the first one, seek the heavenly. See, seeking the heavenly is referring to our new life in Christ, that since we no longer live the old way, we can shed that off or die to that particular part of ourselves. This means that we no longer live the way that the world does. Paul here is giving a summary, really, of the next several verses. And the overall task, if you will. Then he gets into it, and he gets into the nitty-gritty and a little bit deeper and describes what exactly that looks like to seek the heavenly. So, leads us to the next point. In seeking the heavenly, we need to slay the earthly. Um, verses 5 through 9 say, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Now Paul, he gives us a few examples of earthly living. 
And if we're trying to seek the heavenly and move from sin to life, then chances are we, we ought not to be doing those things. And I would like to point out that, though, that this isn't a call to be legalistic and have our works save us. See, only Jesus' death on the cross, burial, and resurrection saves us by faith through grace, not our works. Now, however, with that being said, our actions and thoughts should reflect the love and grace that God extended to us through Jesus. Now, I think the the passage in James 2 talks about this, and uh, uh, we can learn something from that as well. So let me let me read a few verses of that uh, from, from that passage. So James 2, uh, I'm going to start in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. That's good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. See, James and Paul are saying that one's actions should follow what they believe. Paul is looking at it more from the perspective that one ought not to continue in sin. And James is telling us that good works should be what shows instead, which would lead us to the next point, to strengthen the Christly. Now, if we aren't supposed to continue in sin and we are supposed to change how we behave, then let's, let's look at what that might look like. In verses 10 through 11 say, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. So Paul is saying that in order to strengthen the Christly, we put on our new self. And the new self probably looks a lot like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. And it probably looks like not doing the things that he mentioned in the previous verses. It probably looks like being unified as a church. It probably looks like getting rid of any prejudices we might have. Now, I want to dive into that last little phrase, too. um, Because if you're like me, then you might be curious about that phrase. And right there at the end of verse 11, uh, Paul says, Christ is all and is in all. And that phrase, it, it honestly at first was a little confusing to me. It, its phrasing seems a little awkward. Um, so I, I'd like to attempt to explain it for us. And there's, there's really two parts to focus on here. And the, the first part is talking about Christ is all. I think this is meaning that Christ is literally everything or all that matters. And, this, and, and the second part is talking about the relationship that we all share, regardless of life, circumstance, race, or ethnicity, as the body of Christ. So, to strengthen the Christly, we should focus on what matters most, and that's Christ. Now, the key question in red for this section is, have I moved from death to life in Christ? Now, in other words, am I trusting in Jesus for my salvation from sin through his substitutionary atoning sacrifice? See, Jesus didn't come to earth to just be a good example. He didn't come to earth to just heal our physical ailments. He came so that we could have life, not just life here on earth, but eternal life with him. And when we move from death to life, we ought to live like that's true. We ought to seek the heavenly, we ought to slay the earthly, and we ought to strengthen the Christly, because Christ is what matters most. Now in the the next section of the passage, Paul talks in a little more detail what this all looks like. 
And I think specifically he's focusing on what it means to strengthen the Christly. So, the next section, move toward loving unity in Christ. Verses 12 through 14 say, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Now, I think this here is a fairly simple, simple in concept, uh, and it's a little more complex in how we live it out. The idea here is Paul is telling us to choose love. And that's the next point on the outline, choose love. And I, I say this is simple because I'm guessing most everyone here can probably figure out or knows what love is and what love isn't. But Paul still outlines what some of the characteristics of love are. And he lists them in these verses. He lists compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, uh, forgiveness. See, I think Paul's getting at and basically saying that any action that involves love, that ought to be characteristics we adopt. Think about, think about it this way. Paul says to clothe yourselves in these things. Now, I think this is best described like, you know, someone donning new clothes after working outside all day in the dirt and the grime. See, all, all the sin stuff is like the dirt and grime from the day's work. And when we accept God's gift of grace through Jesus, then it's like we take off those old dirty clothes and replace them with the fresh, clean clothes. And let's make it even better and say they're straight out of the dryer so there's that, that little bit of warmth clinging to them. I mean, nothing beats that clean clothes feeling. And when we choose to love and all the characteristics included with love, then it's like we just put those nice warm clothes from the dryer on. Along with this, in the next verse, Paul talks about peace. And if we've put on all these characteristics in choosing love that Paul just talked about, then chances are pretty high that peace will be another major part of our life. And specifically, though, we, we can choose Christ's peace. So in verse 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. See, Christ offers peace, and we can choose to live in that peace. We can choose to extend that peace to others in our interactions and relationships. Peace should be a defining character trait of who we are as Christ followers. Everything we do should be arbitrated through peace, especially in trying circumstances. And, and, and thinking about trying circumstances, I think of Horatio Spafford. Some of you may know who he is. Uh, he was a wealthy businessman in the late 1800s. See, Spafford invested significantly in Chicago real estate right before the Great Chicago Fire, in which his investments were devastated. Now, a couple years later, he sent his family to vacation in England, and he was going to join, he was going to join them later. But the ship sank, and tragically, his four daughters were killed. Spafford got a telegram from his wife, and it simply read, Saved Alone. On the way to join his wife in England, Spafford wrote the hymn, It Is Well. Some of you may know it. I'll, I'll read a, a, a verse or two. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. In the chorus, It is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. See, Horatio, Horatio Spafford was so permeated with Christ's peace that he could embrace Christ's message even in a horrible circumstance, or really horrible circumstances. Now, I, I, I'm going to guess that most of us won't experience anything quite as horrifying as what he did. But if or when we do, 
are we so focused on Christ that our response would be, it is well. I think that's what it means to choose Christ's peace. It means being so focused on the message of Christ that peace is a natural outcome or, or outpouring in our life. Which leads us to the next point. Choose to accept Christ's message. Verses, uh, verse 16 says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Paul's saying that a new life Christian should take the words of Jesus to heart. See, memorize them, meditate on them, dwell on them, so much so that in every situation, the words or message of Jesus come naturally through psalms, hymns, and gratitude. See, so like with Horatio Spafford, do the comfort of Jesus' words pour naturally from our hearts? Are we characterized by Christ's message? Now, what is Christ's message? And I, I'm guessing a, a lot of you may know, but if you don't know, I'm going to point you to the gospel. See, Jesus' message is one of grace, hope, and redemption. Forgiveness, love, and peace. Mercy, justice, and salvation. His message is one that provides healing, renewal, and refreshment. See, we need to choose to accept all that. It does no good if we don't take that to heart. And, and see, and when we do... Shouldn't we live like it's true in our lives? Shouldn't our actions show that we've accepted the grace and mercy of Jesus? Even our thoughts or our words, they all should reflect the message of Jesus. I like how our Bibles today, they often highlight the words of Jesus in red. And that gives us a clear tool to use in learning the words and message of Jesus. So that's a good place to start learning about what his message really is and how we can apply it to our lives. You can read the actual words of Jesus. You can learn them. You can memorize them. Now, I, I know that the words we have are, are, are translations um, because Jesus wasn't speaking in English. But honestly, the scholars who have diligently worked to translate those words have done such a great job that they can be trusted so learn the words of Jesus so that in every situation you can be prepared, especially in tough situations. Now lastly in this section, choose to honor God in everything. That's the next point on the outline. Choose to honor God in everything. Verse 17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm going to be really honest. This one is, is simple. Everything you do, literally everything, do it in the name of Jesus. Not some things, not only the things you know are, are, are good enough, but everything. And now this really raises the standard. I'm going I'm to put it into an illustration for us. See, if, if I'm working for a company, now, I, I usually want to do a good job, and I, I do say usually. And if for no other reason, it's because I, I was taught to work hard and to do my best. Now, what does that mean? That, that, that means that no matter what, no matter who I'm working for, I have to give my full effort and ability, regardless of whether or not my boss deserves it. And let's be honest for a minute. Bosses can be tough to deal with. They aren't perfect. They aren't always reasonable. They don't always understand. Yet Paul says to do everything in the name of Jesus. Paul doesn't just mean actions, though. He says words, too. So if, if we're, we are doing that, then chances are it doesn't matter who you're physically working for. It doesn't matter what they do or say. We, as Christ followers, need to honor God in everything. See, even when others are undeserving of the effort that it entails. I can tell you I'm, I'm a little bit guilty. That's why at the beginning I said I usually want to do a good job. 
Um, I'm, I'm guilty of this because even though I was taught better, I don't always do my best. I don't always try as hard as I can. And I'll make the, the excuse, they don't deserve my best anyway. However, on, on the other side, I've worked in many jobs where the words used and the way people talk, it gets a little, little coarse, a little rough. Yet, I consistently choose to not join in. Because I can choose to use words wisely and be different. I can choose to honor God even when others around me are making it difficult. So this verse doesn't leave room for when it's easy to do it, I will. Or when everyone else is, then I will honor God. Or if the other person deserves it, I'll try my best. But rather, all the time, every time, we need to choose to honor God. That leads us to the key question in red at the bottom there. Do I live as God's chosen? Now, I like what Warren Wearsby said. He said, there are some Christians who will defend the truth at the drop of a hat, but their personal lives deny the doctrines they profess to love. They, prof they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. See, we can defend the truth. We can defend the Bible uh, all day long. But if we aren't living like we are alive in Christ, then that defense is meaningless. So as we move from sin to life, we need to move toward loving unity in Christ. And do I live as God's chosen people? Do I live set apart and as someone dearly loved by Jesus? Or do my actions show the opposite? See, we can choose to live differently than the world. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for your sacrifice and your grace. Help us to honor you in everything we do and in everything we say. Help us to live alive in you today. Help us to live in loving unity with one another and to adopt a life centered around peace. We thank you for your love and we ask that you help us to extend that love to other people. In Jesus' name, amen.